Oh, uh, fantastic. Years. Okay. I'm trying out some ca closed captions for hearing impaired folks. So uh, it's automatically generated. So we'll see how that works. Um, uh, thanks everyone for, for coming out today. Um, so again, I'm Jeff Williams. A couple things about me. Uh, I play on the U.S. national champion 50 and over basketball team. Uh, for fun, I like to design and make boomerangs. And I make my living as a co-founder and CTO at Contrast Security. My goal is to help companies get better at application security. And uh, I've, I've been fortunate to work with hundreds of companies over the last 20 years on their, on their programs. Um, so uh, I thought it'd be fun to, today to talk about SBOMs a little bit. It's something I've been working on a lot recently. And uh, I think they're interesting. And I want to start out, uh, and most of you probably know this, but look, sometimes when you get into the, the, the daily work of application security, it's easy to forget the big picture. So I just want to remind everybody, look, uh, what we do securing software is critically important. It's actually uh, cybersecurity is uh, the number four crisis on the World Economic Forum list of existential dangers to the world. And it comes right after infectious diseases, which we're all familiar with these days, and extreme weather. Uh, cybersecurity crisis is right up there. And if you think about, you know, sort of everything we care about in our lives these days is dependent on software. That includes your government, your social life, your elections, your finances, your power grid, your business. Everything is software. But how much do you really know about that software? Who wrote it? Who tested it? Do you have security problems? Uh, you know, what do you know about it? When you go to when you bank online, and you go to that bank software in your browser on your phone, what do you know about the software that you're trusting all your money to? That's a problem. That's a market failing, and that's a different talk, but uh, it, it's a really critically important problem. And so, uh, I believe that we have a right to know some basic security information about the software that we trust our lives to. We're entering a world of software transparency and there's numerous efforts around the world from OWASP and the US government and Singapore and Finland and all over the world that are pushing for better transparency into software security. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that uh, at the end, but now I wanna focus in on SBOMs. So, Obviously, uh, I, for some folks may not be familiar with SBOMs, this stands for Software Bill of Materials. And it's an incredibly simple idea. Basically, an SBOM is a list of the, the components inside a, a piece of software that you're using. And uh, it doesn't have to be just open source. Uh, components might include uh, services and other things that applications use, but if it's intended to give you a sense of what software is in there. Now, is that enough? Does that achieve the, you know, the sort of the full transparency that I'm looking for? No, but it is a really interesting first step towards getting companies and other software producers to disclose what's going on inside their software. And I believe as software bill of materials become more accepted, what we'll see is more and more transparency that ultimately will allow us to fix the software market so that security is visible and market forces can encourage security to the place where they need to be. Now on the left here is a simple example of an SBOM. It, uh, this was generated by a tool that we're gonna be looking at today, but it's simple. It says, hey, here's some metadata about the application. And then here's a list of components with details about those components. So, uh, you know, the, the coordinates of that component, as well as uh, some interesting properties about it. And that's it. That's what's in an SBOM. So it shouldn't be daunting to anybody. I think anybody can create SBOMs. Anybody can communicate with others using SBOMs. And ultimately, they're a piece of the puzzle in getting a hold of how you're using open source inside your organization and getting that to a place where you've, you know, you're using the latest version of things where you've eliminated known vulnerabilities in, in those things. So SBOMs are, are one piece of that puzzle. 
So a couple of myths I've heard about S-bombs. Uh, some people are resistant to S-bombs because they think that publishing an S-bomb will help attackers. I don't believe that. I think it would be really easy for an attacker to figure out what libraries are in something anyway. And uh, I think you should probably, it, it, it doesn't really help attackers get down the road very far. It doesn't give them details about how your code works. Uh, and there's no intellectual property, there's no algorithms. It's just a list of ingredients. So even Coca-Cola has a list of ingredients on the bottle. It doesn't mean you have the secret formula for creating Coke. Another myth is that S-bombs aren't actionable. I think that's false too. There's great information there that you can use to make decisions about upgrading libraries and uh, you know, using more secure versions of things. Uh, we, we talked about S-bombs don't expose your code. Uh, S-bombs don't scale. I think that one's still TBD actually. Uh, we'll see what happens. If you're in an organization with hundreds or thousands of applications, and you're a DevOps organization that's generating, uh, you know, multiple deployments a day, SBOMs may overwhelm you. If, if particularly uh, if you're, you know, sort of thinking about keeping a database of SBOMs themselves, uh, probably won't scale. But if you think about SBOMs as a communications format, where you're using the SBOM to say update a database full of, the, you know, that, that tracks all of your open source usage then I think you, you can make them work as part of a scalable architecture. And then the last one, last myth uh, is that S-bombs are accurate. And I just made that myth up. So it starts here, but uh, I think many people believe that an S-bomb is an accurate representation of what's in the software. I'm gonna show you some problems today about why that may not be true depending on how you build your S-bombs. Okay, so, uh, I think it's critical that they do accurately reflect the actual software. Uh, it's, uh, it's not, we're not gonna achieve the goals of SBOM in terms of transparency and actionability and, and so on, unless they're accurate. If they're inaccurate, then you're gonna waste a lot of people's time. People are gonna complain about them and uh, they're not gonna use them. So we need to be sure that SBOMs are an accurate reflection of the, the composition of the actual software. So uh, we're gonna dig into some, some uh, issues around uh, why it may or may not be accurate. So the first thing you wanna think about is where does the data inside an S-bomb come from? And so gotta generate it somehow. So how are you gonna figure it out? Most people think of running a tool on a source code repo. You'd point it at a GitHub repo or something and it would, pull down the palm or whatever and figure out what libraries are in it and generate an S-bomb from that. You can do it that way. Uh, we'll talk about some issues there. You could also analyze a binary. So you could look at either a, you know, a, a deployed executable or you could look at a container and you could scan it and you could search uh, for various components that way. It's a little different than what's in the source code repo because uh, now it's built. Um, and it may have some different differences there. We'll talk about those. You can also wait until that application is actually running and then test to see what libraries are inside something. And we'll see that there's some, some differences there. Here, I, I'm thinking about doing it in a test environment, but you almost, you almost uh, could also look in a production environment and see what Applicate what uh, components are in use, and I think in production you'll get more insight into you know the the services that are being used, the backend connections uh, that this application that are part of this application, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. But the source of the data is the first thing to consider. So if someone hands you an SBOM, you may want to just ask, say, "Hey, how was this generated? What data did it use to create this view?" Now I wanna show you a, uh, a tool called JBomb that I created uh, to create SBOMs for Java applications. And it creates both static SBOMs from either local or remote file systems. And it can create SBOMs from both local and remote running applications. So I'm gonna call the ones that come that, you know, that are static, I'll call those static SBOMs. Ones that are from a, a running environment, we'll call those a runtime SBOM. I'm gonna try and point out some of the differences there. 
Now let's take a look at uh, JBOM and, and how it works. So uh, let's see, first thing you probably might wanna do is go find it. So I'm gonna go to uh, GitHub and go to the JBOM project. And you can see here, free and open, uh, easy to use. All you have to do is go to the releases here and uh, download the, no, I'm not gonna sign on and go through that. It's, you just grab a copy of the jar file or you can you can curl it uh, down to your environment. I think I might have an example of that here. So here you can just you know run a command that looks like this uh, and download the latest JBOM jar file. So uh, I already have it existing here, so I didn't overwrite it. So now I've got my, my JBOM jar file and that's that we're gonna run it using java-jar jbomb.jar, that's it. Um, and there's a, a bunch of options here. You can see uh, you can analyze a file here with either scanning a directory or just add a file with the dash D or dash F flags. Uh, you can also uh, use it to analyze a running process or you can, the default is to analyze all running processes and you can do that either locally or remotely. So we'll go through some of these use cases. I think it's kind of interesting. So I actually have uh, an application here. Uh, it's a, a demo app that that's, has log for shell in it. Um, and you'll see here, I've got uh, this my project jar file, which is a typical uh, job application. It's got a bunch of dependencies, including log for J. So let's generate a, uh, a S bomb for that. So to use, uh, JBOM, all you do is java dash jar, JBOM. I'm going to do dash F uh, for the file and do log for shell on this my project file. And it takes about, I don't know, half a second or something. And uh, you'll see here, we've we've now got an S bomb in, uh, we've, we've saved it off. It's got 29 different components in it. And let's take a look at that. So I'm going to go to my, uh, uh, um, IDE here and bring it up just so it's syntax highlighted. And you can see, hey, we just generated a new SBOM. It's got uh, a bunch of components and uh, we can actually uh, roll these up. You can see in, in, a, uh, in this uh, SBOM, you can see there's a list of components and then there's a list of dependencies. The dependencies give you sort of the, the hierarchy of how the components fit together and the components is more like a flat list. And uh, and that's it. Now you might want to use that. You might want to quickly check to see, hey, does that uh, uh, SBOM have log4j in it? And here you can see there's a few different, there's the log4j API, there's the Java Util logging adapter, there's the SLF4j layer on top of log4j, and then there's the log4j core. Uh, so, you know, a number of different pieces, but you can easily figure out that this uh, this SBOM is clearly using log4j 2.14.1, which is susceptible to the log4shell attacks. So that's sort of the basic use. If you have multiple jar files in a directory, um, and I think we have that here, you can, uh, I can run it on this whole directory. And there's two jar files in there. I can run it on the whole thing. And now you'll see we've got 47 components. So if you've got an application that's got, you know, multiple directories with jars and so on, uh, JBob will just figure it out and create a unified um, uh, jar file. Um, back my original one, because we're going to diff it against uh, some stuff. Okay, so that's that. That's a static SBOM. We got that by analyzing a binary. I want to show you now about what we can do to test a, uh, in our generating an SBOM for a running application. So I'm going to run that my project application. And you can see it's a spring application. You can see we get the, the PID here, 39403. And now it's started up. And you can attach to this using JBOM. You don't actually need any parameters. This is the default mode of JBOM. What it's going to do is it's going to search for running processes, running JVMs, and then it's going to inject itself into the application, analyze all the libraries from within, and use that information to generate uh, an SBOM. So let's do that. So here you can see we found our process. 
39403. We attached to it, we analyzed it, and we generated a new SBOM for that app. This will work on multiple applications. You can use a tool like JPS to show all the running Java processes, uh, or you can, uh, you can actually use JBOM for that and uh, do a list and it'll say, hey, we detected one uh, local Java process. So we're just listing it out. And uh, so now we've got two, uh, we've got two JBOMs in our, uh, our directory. Oh, we've actually got three. We did uh, a couple of them. So uh, let's compare the, the two that we need to, that we just generated. So we'll do the first one and the, the third one up here. I wanna compare these files. And interestingly, there's almost no differences, right? We, uh, we generate a different GUID, a different timestamp. Uh, the, the name of the component is a little different because of the way we, uh, we did this, but generally these are exactly the same uh, SBOMs. One generated at runtime, one generated by analyzing the, the binary. But they don't always have to be the same. And we'll look into that a little bit. I just wanted to, before we move into sort of, you know, the, the things that can go wrong with different kinds of uh, SBOM, I wanted to show you that you can use JBOM on a remote host. So um, let me figure out what my IP address is. So um, I got my IP address. Uh, where'd it go? Here we go. So we're going to use this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend that I'm running on a, a remote host here and use java-jar the normal way, but we're going to send it to a remote host. And the reason we want to do this is because imagine you're in an organization with hundreds of environments. You don't want to uh, you know, have to go locally and log into each one of those machines. You want to go remotely and have everything work automatically. So here, uh, we're going to analyze remote hosts. I'm going to give it my uh, SSH credentials to log in. And basically what's happening is we're, we're pushing the uh, JBOM up to that host, we're running it, we're generating SBOMs, and then we're pulling those SBOMs down. And so uh, now we get the, the same SBOM again. Uh, you can see now we've got one more. This one's for the remote host. You can see the, the host name is part of the, the title. And again, we've got the same output from now a remote host. You can also do remote static if, with JBOM if you want. So you could uh, remotely log in and point it at a directory on a remote server and generate an SBOM this way. So it's a little bit of a Swiss army knife here, but uh, kind of a cool way to uh, generate SBOMs quickly across a range of IP addresses, for instance. Um, so let's see, I wanna make sure I'm not missing any questions here. Um, so let's see, uh, nothing re relevant to, uh, to JBOM yet, but if you do have questions about uh, JBOM, please go ahead and ask them. Okay, so let's talk about um, the difference uh, between different techniques for generating SBOM. So uh, the first sort of challenge is just to find the libraries and scanning file systems and containers uh, means that you need to be able to you know, look through all the directories, find appropriate files that may have libraries in them and then scan inside them. And they're often, uh, you know, for Java, it's jar files, war files, ear files, zip files, class files. It could be nested archives. Um, they can get kind of tricky. And so uh, there's a lot of different techniques for deploying code and any tool that you use has to be aware of that technique in order to accurately generate an SBOM. So a couple of techniques that cause problems in Java one is repackaging classes into fat jars. That means instead of having, you know, a hundred individual jar files, uh, you just unzip them and rezip them all into a big jar file. A jar file is just a zip file, by the way. Um, there may be structure to that jar, to a, to a fat jar. Uh, Spring Boot uses a particular format where it pulls the jar files into a uh, a master jar file, uh, an overarching uh, jar file, and it puts the, the, the libraries in a particular location. So if you have to understand that. There's also a complicated technique called shading or re it's also called relocation, where you move the, the package structure. So you, you're, you're taking all the classes out and during the build, you change their package name. So instead of being, uh, you know, org.apache.something, uh, you'll move it to like 
jeff.test.org.apache. And it makes it difficult to recognize these libraries. Uh, there's a question about how this is different than a POM or, or package files. And really POMs are directions for pulling libraries in, but there's also uh, build instructions in like a Maven or something that, uh, that, that will tell the build process how to package all of that code together into an executable, um, into something you can deploy. And so it's, uh, it's important if you're just scanning the, the a file system or container, you may not have the palm. You may not have the, the build instructions. So then you need to go figure it out from uh, the, the files that you have. And so a lot of, of SBOMs are generated that way just by looking at file systems. Um, assuming that you can find the libraries, you, you wanna be sure that you, you understand how the tool identifies that it really has the right library. Like if you're looking at the palm, it's, it's great because the, the name there is the, uh, the name that's used to bring in the file. So there's a good match there. But if you're just looking at uh, a directory, you don't wanna trust the name of the file. It could have been changed or it, it may be uh, deliberately wrong. Uh, it's probably more accurate to use a hash of the, the bytes of the actual file in order to match it up with the library that it, it's supposed to be. Uh, so I think, you know, ultimately uh, using either the dependency tool config or the or a hash on a, a an actual jar file or, or a or library is actually the, you know, the best way to identify the libraries themselves. Now there's a couple of problems uh, with that. So one issue is you don't really want to include any libraries that aren't for production in the in the SBOM. I mean, you may, depending on what you're using the SBOM for, but generally I'm more interested in the stuff that goes into production. That's what creates security risk. And so that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, so you wanna be able to either exclude or at least identify the libraries that aren't involved in production. So you wanna eliminate things like test code, test frameworks, tools and utilities, build and deploy tools, all that stuff uh, should at least be marked in an SBOM and differentiated. Um, so how can you do that? Well, sometimes that that is available in uh, in the build documents, like in the POM, it might say, hey, this is for this phase, but it's not always right. It's uh, interesting to look at you know, uh, an actual deployed application and see what code actually runs that's much more likely to be the, the, you know, the production code. You don't want that test code to actually go into production. And so it's, uh, it's nice to, to analyze the production environment and see that you've got the right stuff. So, that's, so that issue is like being over-inclusive in your SBOM, right? Like putting too much stuff in there really may generate false positives if there's vulnerabilities associated with that. This issue is about libraries that aren't present in code repos. So in many environments, uh, not all the libraries are in the app itself. Many of the libraries come from the environment that it runs in, like the app server or the language platform that you're using. Uh, those libraries are part of the operational environment, should absolutely be included in the SBOM, but you can't get them if you're only looking at a code repo or a, an application binary, you have to look at the whole environment of the running application in order to see these libraries. And it's often things like XML parsers and uh, you know other, other runtime libraries that are provided by the environment, uh, critical to see these. This list, uh, this, this fifth issue here is what I'll call hidden libraries. These are, this is code that gets loaded in some kind of weird way that isn't normally visible. It wouldn't be part of the, the binary. It wouldn't be in the source code repo. Uh, there are lots of techniques for loading classes. Uh, and I'm you know, talking about Java here, but it's also possible in other languages to load code at runtime. It could be just from a, a file. 
uh, of really any format. It could be code that loads from a remote host via URL. Uh, it could be some custom class loading scheme, like maybe you've got encrypted libraries for some reason and your class loader decrypts them before turning it into running code. A lot of environments support plugins. Well, those may not be part of the app that you got an SBOM for, but they're running in your environment. And so you want to know about those. Uh, instrumentation, you know, you know, many times folks run apps with instrumentation capabilities. Maybe, maybe it's an APM tool, maybe it's extra logging. Um, those kinds of things load in at runtime and won't be present in your source code repo. It is also possible to even compile code, like that's what JSPs do, they compile uh, code on the, on the platform itself. Those, that's gonna be all invisible. And you wanna make sure you identify native libraries as well as you know, language specific libraries. Uh, so th they're sometimes part of apps and sometimes they're part of other libraries. So just a bunch of different ways of you know, thinking about pieces that might be missing in an SBOM. So the, the sixth issue I want to point out is, is talking about determining which libraries are active. So it turns out 62% of libraries are inactive. That's this big blue section over here. These are all libraries that are included in the application, but they never run. Usually they are dependencies of other dependencies. So if uh, I'm using library A and it has libraries like B through F as subdependencies, Maybe I only use the piece of, of A that calls B. I don't use the pieces of A that call C through F. So all that code, it gets brought in, it gets built into the binary, it's, it's there, but it never runs. And if you dig a little deeper, you can look at you know, the rest of this, this other 38% uh, is code that actually runs. This big chunk, 26% uh, of the overall library footprint is in active libraries, but it's code that doesn't run. So only 31% of, of these libraries actually runs. And that's important to understand because uh, you, know, you could easily have a library with a vulnerability in your app and that library could run and it still might not be vulnerable because you're not using that part of that library. So uh, this is a, a long way of saying that really this 12% is the, the code that you actually need to worry about of the entire library footprint that goes along with your, uh, your binary into your application. There's not a lot of code that's actually vulnerable. And so visibility into which libraries are active and which aren't is really pretty critical in understanding whether you need to worry about it or not. There's a lot more details like that. We put out a report earlier based on, you know, we, we monitor security across many tens of thousands of applications and uh, the data comes from that. So we actually measured real running applications to see how much of libraries are actually used across a bunch of different languages. So, you know, this is, is a aggregation of Java, .NET, .NET Core, Node, Ruby, Python, Go, Scala, Kotlin, and, and so on. And the last one is uh, services. So SBOMs support services. I think it's fair to think about services as, as a component of an application and they should be listed in there uh, because in a lot of ways, you know, you could either get a library and run that code locally or you could call an API to do that function for you. And, you know, from a, from a user needs to know about it perspective, they're both the same. Uh, and there's a bunch of a bunch of services that we could talk about, uh, you know, queues and databases and serverless functions are exploding. Uh, even things like mainframes, uh, you probably should know about those as part of the application. Okay, so that's a bunch of issues, and here's how I like to to sort of sum it up. If you're doing a, a static uh, SBOM based on a source code repository. You'll probably find most of the libraries. You'll miss the runtime libraries that we talked about. Uh, you'll, uh, you, you've got a really good case for that you've identified the libraries correctly. Like you're not gonna get tricked by the names or, or anything. Uh, so that's good. 
you are probably able to exclude most build and test libraries because that's usually available in the build instructions, but you're going to miss some things. You're going to miss uh, all the libraries that are part of your platform and your app server. You're going to miss those hidden libraries that I talked about, uh, you know, plugins and whatnot. And you're going to miss uh, which libraries are active. It, you know, if you're just looking at the static app, there's no way of determining whether libraries are, are really active or not in the running application. Uh, and you won't be able to find services very easily. Uh, you know, there's, there's no great way to say, oh, this application talks to this database and this, this API and, and so on. It's pretty close to the same with binary S -bomb, static binary SBOM generation. Uh, a little bit, uh, a few little differences. Uh, you, you should be able to exclude build and test libraries because they probably won't show up in the binary. And you could probably have a little bit more trouble identifying libraries because you don't have the original names. You just have the names of whatever they got turned into in the, in the binary. Now, runtime uh, SBOMs from a test environment and from a production environment are pretty close. The only difference is that if you do it in a test environment, you may not be able to see all the backend connections because they're not, you know, it's not real. Uh, you know, production application SBOM, you should be able to get access to all of this information. Uh, so I, I'm encouraging you to investigate the use of runtime SBOM generation. I think there's a lot of advantages to doing things this way. And uh, as you can see with uh, tools like JBOM, it's pretty easy to generate uh, runtime SBOMs. Uh, good question uh, from, the, from the list here. It says, uh, would be interesting to know your take on Cyclone DX and what convinced you to select it for JBOM over other formats. Yeah, um, you know, we looked at the different formats. I, I don't think, you know, in the, in the big scheme of things, it matters that much. I mean, it's like, for me, it, it's, it's like XML versus REST, like it's, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, JSON, it's basically has the same information there. Um, but uh, I chose Cyclone DX because I found the tool support much better. Uh, if you look at the, the core lib for Cyclone DX, it makes it easy to generate SBOMs. Uh, it's a more modern format, so I think it's pretty straightforward. It's in JSON and XML. So uh, it uh, supports a lot of different uh, integrations easily. And uh, it's an OS project, so I, I like that. You know, it's free and open for everybody, and there's a nice team uh, working on it. Uh, I've been really impressed with, with Steve Springett's work here, and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say in a little bit. Uh, so he'll be able to, to argue for uh, Cyclone DX probably much better than me, but uh, I think it's the most straightforward format. I did try to implement SPDX, uh, and uh, it was much more difficult. I, just the API to, to use it is you know, complicated, let's say it that way. Um, so that's why I chose it. Okay, um, one thing I think you should really think about when you're thinking about SBOMs is getting a database of some sort. There's multiple different kinds of systems you can use to ingest SBOMs. Uh, but I think if, you, if your plan is just to generate a bunch of SBOMs and then you know, good things will happen, I think that's a little bit hopeful. I think what you really need is uh, to, you know, first of all, you know, the, you gather the SBOMs, put them in a database, you know, make that process automatic. So you're, every time you change something, you're automatically updating SBOMs and, and importing them into a database. Because ultimately, you know, these queries at the bottom are the kinds of questions you're going to want to answer. Like there's going to be an emergency and you're going to say, hey, show me all the apps where I'm using Log4j or, you know, Apache Commons exec or whatever the next crisis is about, uh, you're going to want to be able to find those applications very quickly. But one challenge people had was it's not really enough to just find the apps. Like if, if you just know that you have, uh, uh, you know, 40 repos that have this problem, 
that doesn't really tell you all the places that code might be running. So another advantage of runtime SBOMs is uh, you should know all the places where that application is being used. And ultimately you wanna ask the question, like show me the servers where log4j is both active and vulnerable, like a vulnerable version. That's the, that's the to-do list in a crisis is you need to go find those and patch them immediately. Uh, so, you know, uh, you want to optimize your, your SBOM processing for that. I do think it's really critical that uh, you, you know whether applications are active, whether uh, libraries are active within uh, an application and whether they're vulnerable. Those are the, like, to me, those are the two questions. So if you're thinking about setting up your schema, like uh, those are the things that you want to have uh, columns for. It helps to know uh, what servers each of these applications is used on. And, you know, depending on how you deploy something like uh, JBOM, you could be continuously reporting library information every time something starts up, for instance, um, so that you always know what's running where. And you want to set it up in a way that it's continuously up to date. It's not something that you're doing a one-time scan for, and then you wait for the next problem, and then you got to run around and scan uh, your entire enterprise for for libraries. It's much better to have an up-to-date database where you can just go ask this question immediately when you want to you have a, a crisis that you need to deal with. Uh, there's a question about how do you do runtime SBOM on a proprietary embedded device? Uh, mm, it's a good question. It really depends on uh, the, the language specifics. Uh, and I'm talking theoretically here. I don't know of any tools that could do this, but in theory, you could uh, attach, attach to a running uh, device. Uh, if it's completely proprietary, then you're probably screwed. But if it's, uh, you know, maybe it's an Android device or something, uh, it is possible to attach debuggers to that kind of thing. And so therefore you could attach uh, a tool that generates an SBOM. Uh, but, you know, I'm really pushing the concept of runtime SBOMs here. I don't have a, a tool ready for every single platform out there. Well, Jeff, if uh, the um, embedded device is running uh, Java and it's possible to SSH into it, uh, we could just use JBOM, right? Absolutely, yeah. And it doesn't, it's not just, it's anything that runs on a JVM, right? So it's, uh, you know, Scala, Kotlin, whatever should all work. Okay, uh, great question. Um, there's another question about, are there any tools available to determine which libraries are active? And uh, yeah, that's something I'm adding to JBOM. It's really not that complicated to, uh, to instrument an application to do that. Um, basically, you just watch the application run and keep track of uh, every time a library gets gets used. Uh, it, it's uh, it uh, like I said, it's uh, it's not difficult to add to JVM. I just maybe if somebody would file a, uh, a pull request uh, for it, then I could do that much more quickly. But uh, if not, file an issue and, and let me take it up. So yeah, the, this JBOM is only for JVMs currently. I don't have anything for Node or a question about NPM, um, but it's certainly possible. Like people should build versions of JBOM and now I wish I hadn't named it JBOM and should have named it like, you know, RBOM or something, but uh, uh, it's certainly possible to build runtime uh, SBOM tools for every environment. And Jeff, I think we discussed it before, right? Because uh, OWASP is uh, open source, right? It's a great idea for another OWASP open source project, right? To have an NBOM for .NET or NPM yep. or uh, any other. And uh, of course, uh, if anyone would like to start that project and uh, collaborate, uh, of course, uh, that's what OWASP is all about. It's just uh, if, if you think there's a missing tool, missing project, documentation, standard, just uh, start one as open source uh, and uh, um, uh, OWASP will support you. Yeah, I strongly, it's a great way to get into uh, to security and build your reputation. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's a fantastic project. It's really not that complicated. Uh, 
because you know Steve Springett has done a lot of the work in terms of generating the SBOM itself. All you got to do is write a little tool that attaches to an application and figures out what libraries are in there. Uh, it, it's like you look at the code for JBOM, it's really not that much code. Uh, okay, so I wanted to bring it all back full circle here. Um, I started the talk talking about transparency and I think SBOMs are a great first step towards transparency into what's going on inside applications. I think it will help move the market uh, and make help people make better security decisions. But there are some other things going on that I think are really interesting. And uh, in Finland and Singapore, they've adopted the cybersecurity labeling scheme. So this is a little bit like uh, in New York City, we put uh, labels on windows that say, hey, this, uh, you know, the Department of Health thinks this uh, restaurant is an A, all the way down to F uh, if you're not doing very well. Uh, and so I think it's really useful to label software. I've been arguing for this for uh, going on 20 years now, uh, trying to make the case that we need to have this kind of labeling. Think about all the things that have labels. It's drugs, cars, uh, food has labels on it. Your water heater probably has an energy star kind of rating on it. Movies, uh, just about everything has a chainsaws. Everything has a label. And you know why? It's because labels work. Labels inform consumers about risks so they can make smart decisions. Uh, and that is exactly what we need to do in security. It may not, you know, consumers may not immediately use these labels. That's fine. Most labels get used by the product producers first because their lawyers won't let them go to, to market with a product that, that says, hey, this will cause, uh, you know, <laughs> instant aging or uh, terrible, terrible pain or something. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of pressure on organizations to do better at securing code. If you're building secure code already, then you shouldn't have a problem with putting labels on it and being truthful about what's in there. Um, so it's really not a, an extra burden. Um, in the US, the, the administration recently put out a, a cybersecurity uh, executive order that directed NIST to, among other things, to uh, require SBOMs on uh, a number of different kinds of applications and to investigate the use of a labeling scheme for software in the US. And so that work is under underway right now. Uh, I participated in their, their forum and uh, provided comments, but uh, this could actually happen in the US that uh, software producers are required to label their software somehow. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that comes out. Cause I think it's the next step, you know, like first step is SBOM. Next step is like some more comprehensive kind of label. And ultimately the goal is to get real transparency into uh, the security of applications. And if you remember the, the mission of OWASP, which we created in uh, 2002 or something, was to make application security visible so that people and companies can make informed decisions about the security, uh, uh, the, about software security risks. And I still think it's the right mission for OWASP is to really push transparency so that we get the market forces working for us instead of against us. Uh, I, I wanted to, I always do this at OWASP talks. I'd like to uh, try to help folks that are starting out in application security. If that's you, check out the article on the left here called How to Vulnerability. It's a, a tutorial on how to communicate security problems to the people that need to know about them. And it's based on 20 years of work uh, doing pen testing and code reviews and architecture reviews and threat modeling. Uh, for both me and my companies. And uh, I encourage you to read it because it's probably one of the most important skills in AppSec. Uh, it doesn't help anything if you find a great vulnerability, but you're sitting over in a corner and uh, can't describe you know, what the problem is to anybody. So this is a way of, uh, of actually learning how to do this really effectively. And I, 
I would almost guarantee that uh, even if you're a fantastic security researcher, you're not as good as you could be at uh, talking about those vulnerabilities and getting people to do stuff. The other article is a bigger picture article about how security fits into a modern software factory. And I think there's some interesting ideas in there. Uh, it's kind of a DevSecOps approach to thinking about AppSec that may uh, get your creative juices flowing. So uh, check that out. And I'd love to get your feedback on that. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can, I think uh, there's a link up there in the, the chat right now. Um, and I'd love to discuss uh, AppSec with you. So with that, I, uh, I don't know, Sam, do I have time for a few questions? There's a few in the chat I'd love to address, if not. Uh, yes, Jeff, uh, with uh, quite a few questions, please do um, uh, answer the questions. I okay. will uh, put them yeah. on the screen now. Great question from, uh, do I have to stop sharing? Um, so yeah, great question from James Holland. Uh, it says, uh, would you say that pushing the S-bombs to the actual inventory system periodically? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, it, anytime anything changes, you're going to have to change the S-bomb. Uh, so, you know, you could do it every time you deploy. Uh, it's, it's not an expensive operation. I mean, you saw how fast JBomb runs, it's like a second. So uh, even on large complex applications, it, it runs really quickly. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to uh, keep that inventory up to date so that you've always got it, always got good information. Uh, and there's a, there's a comment from Tom that says, uh, hey, the, uh, the labeling program required by the executive order only applies to consumer software. Sure. Yeah, we got to start. I don't know, you know, is consumer software like uh, the, the website where you do your online banking? Seems like it should be. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. Um, and uh, there's a, a comment about the Singapore and Finland is... Yeah, you're right. In Simicron, it is mostly about uh, IoT products and applications, uh, you know, devices, uh, as opposed to, you know, much something much broader. I, I hope we can start with a broader scope. I think it's it's way past time to have transparency in our market. But, uh, you know, I, I can't control what NIST does. I, some, some of what they do is fantastic. Some of it is, uh, you know, kind of waterfall uh, legacy approach stuff. Uh, and I'm, I give them a lot of feedback. So uh, I, I hope we're moving the right direction. Jeff, there was also a question from Nathan, uh, which I think a few other attendees have uh, answered, but it would be interesting to hear your opinion on this as well. Oh yeah, it's great. So uh, uh, I think it's fair to ask your vendors for S-bombs and as a vendor, we get we get this question quite a lot. So we have S bombs for our stuff. We can you know, just we're happy to deliver that to you. Um, but there is going to be some pushback from some companies that aren't really as forward thinking. So, uh, you know, I, I I'm not sure what uh, gets the market to tip to the point where everybody has to uh, provide S bombs with their stuff. Certainly, you know, some kind of regulations. Uh, would help, but uh, it's. I can imagine it happening other ways. I, I think the best thing we can do as uh, as OWASP and as uh, you know OWASP members is to just continuously push for uh, for S bombs. Say you know make it clear to your vendors that I want to see S bombs, and give them a deadline and say, uh, hey, it's not hard to generate these things. Why are you not disclosing this to me? I need to know. I can't trust your software without this information. Um, and tell them, look, if you don't do it and give me the S-bomb, then I'm just going to use J-bomb to generate them myself or some other tool. <laughs> it's not its not a secret. You're, you're delivering me the software already. I can just look inside there and figure it out. Uh, I'd, it'd just be easier if you did it for me. Good question here from uh, from YouTube, right? If I were to propose JBOM in our organization, they will question maintenance and support. How do I convince their internal stakeholders? I think well, it's a generic one for any open source software, right, Jeff? I don't think yeah, it's a that's more specific think, issue. Yeah, I think that's the key is, uh, you know, look, it is open source. It's not a zillion lines of code. 
if uh, if there's a problem, you know, you can participate. You don't have to just use open source and never give back, right? Uh, I think they probably won't like this logic, but like really open source, uh, it only works if people contribute. And if you're getting a big advantage from JBOM, like, I don't know, maybe you don't have to buy a commercial tool, you just use JBOM. Well, great. But how about you know kicking in some some support? Maybe uh, contribute a developer to fix some bugs, or uh, add a feature, or uh, participate in some way, make the world a little better. Uh, you know, if you don't like it, uh, you know you can. I, I suppose you could hire a company to uh, you know pay someone else to maintain it and support it. Um, I think actually, if you. Uh, you know, we can, we can figure it out. If you've got resources you want to put behind it, then we can figure it out. We can find people to guarantee that it'll be maintained and supported. This, this is a broad question. It says, how do we move from vulnerabilities into more risk-based evaluation? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think, you know, the way I think about it is uh, the more context you can add, uh, the, the better you can evaluate the risk of something. So I, I talked about a couple aspects of context today, right? If the library is, is active, then it's much more significant risk than if it's inactive. Uh, and so it's really, to me, it's all about adding that context. So there is a lot of context that you can detect automatically. That's what IAST is all about is, you know, it's more accurate because it understands the context of an application better. You know, IAST can see all the backend connections. It can see the configuration. It can see the, uh, the transactions. It can actually tell whether each route is a, a, a state changing transaction, whether it's not item potent. So like all that context allows you to make better decisions about risk. So, you know, like, to me, the future is uh, tools that understand the context. So instead of just looking at each piece individually, like you look at libraries with one tool, then you look at the custom code with another tool, and you look at the APIs with another tool, and you look at the serverless with another code. Instead, what you want is the ability to do all of that analysis in as part of one thing. I think it's ridiculous that people are doing SCA and AST with separate tools. You can't do application security testing without understanding the libraries and what they do. And you can't do SCA, you can't do software composition analysis without understanding what the code is doing and, uh, and whether the libraries are actually used. So it's really, it's one analysis of one running application and it's not, it also includes the server and the runtime. It's that whole thing is what you're analyzing. And so like the way Gartner thinks about it is bizarre to me. Like you have to have a standalone tool for each of these things, SCA, AST, uh, you know, IAS, DAS, whatever. It's, it's silly. It should, what you want is, is to use the best tool for the best, for each of the pieces of the analysis that you need to do and have a, an environment where it brings all that analysis together so that you can see the risks. An interesting uh, comment from Juan as well. Why is it not uh, SBOM? I assume, why is it not a competitive advantage for the software supplier? It should be. It absolutely should be. So I think what you're saying is like, hey, if I'm a software supplier and I publish my SBOMs, then why shouldn't that be an advantage in the market? Like people should say, oh, uh, contrast, you're a really good vendor because you're transparent about the way that you do security. You're, you're willing to step up and publish your SBOMs and maybe you'll publish a security label when it comes time to do that. Uh, I absolutely think it can and should be an advantage in the market. And currently the market is broken. And so you, you can't tell the difference between good software and bad software because there's no transparency. And until we, and this is, this is how we fix the market is through things like SBOMs and labels and, and transparency. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for an amazing talk, Jeff. 